Let me start by saying hi to all of you and welcome to uh, Water Day today. We are so glad and honored that you came to be a part of it. My name is Ed Martin. I'm one of the pastors here at Community Christian Church, and we are thankful that you came to be with us today as we kick off what we call our Do Something initiatives. Uh, for the last several years, maybe almost a decade now, we have every year at this time kicked off initiatives where we try to make a difference in our world and in our community by knowing that we can't do everything to alleviate the suffering and poverty in our world, but we feel bound and obligated, and we want to do something. And just by you being here today, you've made a difference by providing drinking water for people in Haiti. Uh, over the next several weeks, as you just saw in that video, there's going to be a number of things that we're going to have the opportunity to do, and we'd love for you to participate in them. But again, I just want to say thank you for coming to be a part of this today. I hope at the end of the day you felt welcome, uh, that you were felt included, and that uh, you had a good time, too, and that maybe you'll come back and help us over the next few weeks. Well, for the last few weeks, we've been in this series called Fearless. We tend to teach around here in series, and we've been talking about fear because so many of us in our world, uh, in our culture, we live with this underlying fear or even fear that's oppressive to us. And today, as we sort of end this, I want to talk to you about a fear that almost all of us know. It's a fear that has to deal with what the future holds, what's going to go on in the future, how, what's going to happen in my future. Uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but you know, anytime that you lose something, anytime there's a potential for you to lose something, the thought about how that's going to affect your future, it, it just has this impact on you. When you think about your life, as long as it stays pretty predictable and as everything's going along, you can sort of predict that the future is going to be like the past. But when there's a chance that you're going to lose him or you're going to lose her, or you're going to lose someone or you're going to lose that job or you're going to lose this place, it, it, when, the, when the future becomes uncertain of what's going to happen, then fear becomes a part of it. And I think it's even more complicated, this whole thing about our future and what's going to happen with loss. I think it gets even more complicated when... The choice about the future, the decision about that loss is in our hands. And what I mean by that is when you're at a crossroads, a decision point where you know that there's something you need to decide and you think that there's, you're pretty sure there's something that you need to do, but this way is way more predictable. When there's something over here that you pretty fe much feel like needs to happen, but over here is what you feel like maybe you know, it's just more the way it ought to be. When, when you're faced with that decision point and you can't really see the future, uh, fear calls us to stay with what's predictable. For instance, you know, some of you are in a situation where you, you're in a job and you don't really like your job, but when, when it comes to jobs, you think to yourself, there, there just aren't a lot of other jobs out there, and so this is predictable and this is what I need to stay with, but I, I sort of feel like I ought to go with this, go with this opportunity, go with this thing, but the fear of what's of what's unpredictable about the future, it holds you back from going the way that you want to do. You know, some of you are you're here, you're 14 to 18, you're in, your parents are talking to you about your friends all the time, your friends aren't very good, and we wish you had better friends, and you, those people are leading you down a wrong way. And, and when you're 14 to 18, you say to your parents what all of us said to our parents when we were at that age, which is, but they're my friends. They're, these are my friends. And when you look into the future, you don't see any other friends out there anywhere. I mean, these are the friends that you have, and they may not be the best friends, and even you aren't all that happy with them all the time, but they're your friends, and the thought of being without them in, in the future, it, it keeps you from doing maybe what even you know that you need to do. It gets even more complicated for some of us who are followers of Christ, and I, I get that all of us aren't at that place yet. Some of you are here, and you're just checking it out. You came at an invitation of, of a friend to, to honor them, to be a part of what we're trying to do here. But for those of us who are followers of Christ, it gets more complicated, and we feel like there's something that maybe God wants us to do. I'm in a bad marriage, and when I look into marriage, it, it doesn't look like it's ever going to get any better, and I feel like I ought to bail out, but I really feel like God would want me to stay, that God would want me to honor my commitment, but as I look at the future, I can't see where that future is ever going to get any better, and this over here, this way, it feels like it'd be better. So my fear of what's going to happen, of doing what God wants me to do, it keeps me from, from honoring God. In fact, some of you who are here and you wouldn't say you're a church person or maybe you'd say you used to be a church person or you're a person who's spiritual and you, you honor God but you don't really do the church thing, you'd say that maybe the way that you sort of parted ways with God 
you you haven't really thought about it, but the point where you used to be and you sort of got off track, this isn't true for everybody, for, but for a lot of you, you'd look back and you'd say, it didn't happen on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock where you said, okay, that's the point I left. It happened over time where there were things you felt like God wanted you to do and you felt like if you did that, there'd be something you'd lose or something you wouldn't be able to do or someplace you wouldn't be able to go or something that wouldn't happen in your life. And this other way, it looked way more predictable for your future. And so you couldn't see how this was going to be good with God. And so as you look back, that's where you began to part ways. It was a fear of what was going to happen if you honored God that, that kept you from, you know, the, the fear of the future of what God was going to do. That's what kept you from doing what God wants you to do. Well, what do you do in situations like that? What do we do when we're in those dilemmas where fear overwhelms us? We don't know what the future is going to hold. We don't know where it's going to go. How do you move forward in that when it looks like fear is calling you to a way more predictable thing, but this is pretty much you know what you ought to do? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about today as we end this series of how to live a fearless life. And to get at that, I want to talk to you about a story that's in the Old Testament. It's one of my all-time favorite stories. Those of you who've been around know that because I've taught about it several times. It's in an older part of the Bible uh, in the Old Testament. And just in case you aren't all up on your ancient Babylonian history, let me give you the historical context of this because this is a historical account. This happened about 605 B.C., so somewhere, you know, around 2,600 years ago, this took place in Babylon, and since Babylon still not on the, is not on the map today, it, it's Iraq. And Iraq and Israel are at war, which seems like that's always the truth. That was true 2,600 years ago. And uh, Babylon, or Iraq, is the world superpower, and they're taking over everything. And one of the things that happens when they take over a place is they not just only conquer the place and put them subject to them, but one of the things that their king, King Nebuchadnezzar, is doing is he's had this thought of, I ought to have the best of everything. I ought to have the best capital city. I ought to have the best artist. I ought to have the best craftsman. I ought to have the best thinkers. I ought to have the best of everything in the capital city. If we're the best empire, we ought to have the best of everything. So when he goes into a particular culture, he brings back the best of everything, artists, thinkers, everything. But he particularly goes after the young. And his thought is, I can train them up while they're young and make them sure that their allegiance is ultimately to me. Now, one of the things that happens when you bring back all of these cultures, all of these languages, all of these peoples, is you also get all of their religions. And Nebuchadnezzar begins to think that's not all that good a thing, that all these religions, that they have religions that are, call their allegiance to somebody higher than them. And he knows that he can't really fight what they believe in their heart, so he just th says to himself, look, you believe whatever you want to, think whatever you want to in the privacy of your home, but when it comes to your ultimate allegiance, you need to know your life is in my hands, that I ultimately hold your ultimate allegiance. That's what I want to make sure. So that's where we are. This is Daniel chapter 3. We're going to look at the whole chapter, not all at once, but I want to just walk you through this, and we'll make a point about uh, living a fearless life at the end. Here's what happens. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high, 9 feet wide, or it says cubits in some of your translations, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. Now, we don't know what this image is that Nebuchadnezzar set up. We don't know if it's an image of him. Some scholars think that. And lots of people think that is the image of the god he's named after, which the god's name was Nebu. Uh, they think that's who Nebuchadnezzar set the statue up to. It doesn't really matter. What he's done is he's built this huge statue, 90 feet high, which is just huge, and 9 feet wide, and he's put it in the middle of an open field, and he's called everybody in his province, all the officials, to come together to view it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, so the guy who speaks for the king says, This is what you're commanded to do, O peoples, nations, men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So again, he, he offered them total freedom of worship. You have the freedom to bow down and worship this idol, or you have the freedom to die. You, you choose. And you can believe what you want to believe, and you can think what you want to think in the privacy of your heart, but you just need to know 
When I tell you to bow before this statue, your life is in my hands and you better bow down. Well, you can just imagine, everybody did. I mean, they'd all seen their nations collapse before this kingdom, before this man. So when the, when the music played, they fell to the ground. Look at verse 8, where the plot thickens a little bit. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. For there are some Jews who have not, that you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you set up. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are already well known in Babylon. In fact, in the first couple of chapters of the book of Daniel, we find out that they are some of these men, these wise men, the young men that have been brought back. And they become famous for another thing that's happened in their life. And Nebuchadnezzar really likes them so much that he promotes them. But the rest of the politicians don't really like that they've been promoted, and they're doing what politicians do. They think if we can pull them down, we'll climb a little higher. And so they come and tell Nebuchadnezzar what's happening bad with these guys. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I've set up? Now... And he's going to give them a second chance because he likes them. Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I've made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Now, when you and I face one of these dilemmas that we talked about before, where we have a decision to make and we're pretty sure this is the right way and... This way looks way more predictable, but we're pretty sure this is what I ought to do. But our fear calls out to us that you'll be safer over here. When we're in those times, and we know in our heart, for those of us who are followers of Christ, what we think God wants us to do, and yet the way seems way brighter and way clearer, and the future seems way more secure over here. As you're trying to work through, what am I going to do? Is we would pray through what we're going to do, then... In your mind, there's a little voice that begins to talk it to you. There's the fear that begins to speak to you. And our fear tends to say to us exactly what Nebuchadnezzar says in the next few words. Because we view our circumstances, we view this dilemma, and it's, when we're in those choice points, it's so overwhelming to us and so controlling, and we believe we're at the mercy of our circumstance. I'm the mercy of this relationship. I'm at the mercy of this decision. I'm at the mercy of my boss. I'm at the mercy of this health condition. We believe we're totally at the mercy, and there's a little voice that our fear speaks to us, and it says almost exactly what he said. He said, But if you do not worship, you will be thrown immediately in, bla in the blazing furnace, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? If you don't give in to your fear, if you don't go the way that seems secure, if you don't go the way that looks predictable, if you don't go with what everybody's telling you is smart and safe and secure, well, then what's going to happen? What's going to happen after that? Come on now. Isn't that what you hear? Don't you hear that little voice inside of you that says, you know, if I, if I break up with him, then... I'm going to be all alone, and I, I, don't, I can't stand being alone. If I break it off with her and nobody comes along, if I take that option, well, there aren't any other jobs out of here. If I do this deal and I lose it, I don't, I don't have time to remake that money. What's going on in our mind is the question is, what then? What then? What happens if you do what you think is right? What, what then? What does the future hold in that? Because, see, Nebuchadnezzar believed what we often believe. We believe that he believed that he was in control of their lives. And we often believe that our circumstances have absolute control of our life. And you see, what we get tripped up, what I get tripped on, what you get tripped on, up on is the, well, what then? What, what then are you going to do? What God will be able to save you if that's what you do? And that's why I love this story so much and why I often come back to it personally and why I teach it so often. It's, 
It's because of what comes next out of these three guys' mouths. And I don't know what you think about the Bible. I, and I know some of you are here just because you're invited, and we're glad you came. And, and I know some people look, and they, you know, they sit and they go, hey, man, it's been about 10 minutes, and you're not totally boring, and you've made it sort of interesting, and even sounds a little bit applicable, but I don't know if any of this is even true. I, I don't know if this is true or not. Well, what I want to say to you is what, what comes out of these guys next, it, it's not the kind of thing that gets said in myths. It's not what gets told in fairy tales. What gets said next is so insightful, and it, it gives us insight to the question, what then? What then am I going to do? What am I supposed to do when I can't see the future clearly? What, what do I do when I think this is the right thing, but I don't know what's going to happen? Yet? What am I supposed to say when I don't know the answer to the question? Well, what happens then? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. In other words, king, we're so grateful for you, and you're so generous to us by not throwing us immediately in the fire. But you need to understand, it's not that we didn't understand what you were saying. We understood what you were saying, and we don't really need your second chance. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, here it is, the God we serve is able to save us from it. That's it. That's what we're banking on. The fact that our God is able to save us, that's what we're counting on. The fact that we have a God who is able to save us, that's good enough for us. And the fact that he is able to save us is all that we need. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. We think they didn't know. They didn't know what was going to happen next. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you to know, O oh, king, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you set up. Now, this is so important, I just don't want you to miss it. We don't know what's going to happen to us. We don't know what's going to happen. So we've decided, they say, we're going to cast our fate with the one who is able to control the future. Not you, king, who think you're able to control the future. We're going to cast ourselves. I mean, I, I get, king, that I know you're powerful and I know you win every battle. And I know you're surrounded by people. You're named after a God and you think you're a God and people tell you every day you're a God. And I know you think you hold all the future in the hand. But in the end, you're just a king. And king... We will not abandon the one who is able to save us from your hands and able to control our future for the sake of you who think you control the future. We're going to go with the one who is able to do it. So, King, we don't know what's going to happen in just the next few seconds after we're done talking, but we're placing our bet because we think there's more security with the one who is able than the one who thinks he is able. Do you know what you and I are supposed to do when we come to those kind of moments? We have to ask ourselves, am I going to go with the one who is able to tell me about the future and control my future and is with me in my future? Now, or am I going to go with what looks so predictable, but it doesn't really control my future? And I know what your objections are. They're the same ones I had. It, it, it's... God, you're so big and strong and you're so capable of it and I'm weak and I get that and I don't know what to do and I'm looking to you, but God, I need a guarantee. I want to know how it's going to work out. I want to know if I quit this job and do what I feel like you're calling me to do, I want to know that it's all going to be okay. If you just show me that it's all going to be okay, I'm your boy. I'm with you. I will do what you want me to do. You say, hey, I'll break up with her. I just want to know that I'm not going to be alone. In fact, what I'd like to know, God, is I'd, I'd like to have a little overlap. I'd, I'll be willing to break up with her if I could just, if I could just get her to say yes. If, if I can get her to say yes before I break up with her, God, I am with you. I just, I just want to know that I'm going to be okay. I mean, God, I, I get what people are saying about my friends, and I, I, don't even like, I don't like where we go. I don't like what we do. I don't like, I, I don't like myself all the time, but... You know I can't be alone. I want to know that I'm going to be okay. Could, 
Can I just have a little bit of a guarantee? See, you know what the answer to our objection is? The, this desire we have for that? It, it, it's just to think through all the options we really have. And by that, I mean, if you aren't going to go with God, if you aren't going to go with the one who can control the future, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going I'm to go with what I know. I'm going to go with what... I'm going to go with what my fear is telling me. I'm going to go with what seems so secure. Well, well, let's talk about that. Okay, let, let's just take our three Hebrew young men through it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What's going to happen if you say no to the king? Well, he's going to, he's going to kill us. Well, what's going to happen if you, if you say yes to the king? Well, we're going to live. Well, what's, that, what's going to happen in six months when he gets upset again? Well, I don't know what's going to happen in a year. I don't know. So the truth is, you don't really know what's going to happen in your future if you say yes either, do you? Well, what's going to happen if you say no? Well, he's going to kill us. You hurt us, and it's going to happen right now. Well, do you, do you know he's going to kill you? Do you know you're going to die? Well, that's what he said, and he does what he says, but do you know? Well, I don't know for sure, but, but that's what he said. Well, then the truth is, you don't know either way. You don't know that if you do what he says that six months down the road you'll be okay and you don't know that, that six minutes from now you won't be okay if you do what you believe is right. Either way, you don't know. I mean, isn't that true for you? Isn't it true that you really don't know? Oh, but I, I'll never meet anybody else like this. There'll never be another deal like this. There'll never be another opportunity like this. But do you know a year down the road? Do you know where this is going to take you down, down the road? Well, I don't know. Well, I know it's a great opportunity, but do you know how it's going to pan out five years from now? Well, no, I, I, I get it. I don't know. Well, then, if you know this is what God wants you to do, if you're sure this is the right thing to do, and it's just because you don't know the future, you don't know the future either way. Why wouldn't you go with the one who is able to take care of your future instead of what tells you it's able to take care of right now? Isn't it true we don't know either way? Isn't it true that in those dilemmas where we think about the future, I don't know any way? We think we know. We think that this health issue has our future in his hands. We think, I mean... Fear turns everybody into a prophet, and this is what's going to happen, and that's going to happen, and we predict our future. Fear drives us to think that it knows so much, but the truth is, we don't know. And so fear causes us to get short-sighted and cast our whole lives, in some cases, uh, our, our, our relationships, our families. Fear causes us to cast them all aside for what controls just the next few minutes. Why would we go with that when I don't know, especially when there is a God who is able to take care of the future? Can I just give this to you in a nutshell today? It, maybe you don't know this, and for those of you who are followers of Christ, I just need to say this again to cement it for you. We don't trust God. This is just basic Christianity. Christians don't trust God because we know what he's going to do. We do not trust God because we know what will happen in the future. We trust God because of what he can do and what he has done in the past. We don't have faith in God because we know what's going to happen when we pray. We don't trust God because he's given a road map to us for every moment in our life. We trust God. That's not what faith in God is. We trust God because of what he can do and what he has done in the past. And what he has done is he's come for us he's been with us he's given his son for us his life given up so that our sins could be forgiven and we could walk with him and he could be with us and the holy spirit could live in us we do not trust god because he tells us that everything in the future will go exactly the way we want we trust him because of what he can do and what he has done in the past that's what christian faith is is trusting in what God is able to do. Our faith, our hope is in his ability. That's why we trust him. Let me give you the rest of the story so that you don't, get, you don't miss out on the good part because my favorite part hasn't happened yet. This, I'm just going to read the last part to you really quick. 
then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego after they'd said no. And his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded the strongest of his soldiers' army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisor, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see a fourth man walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed and the fourth looks like the son of the gods nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted shadrach meshach and abednego servants this is great servants of the most high god come out come here we're almost to my favorite part so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and no smell of fire was on them. Here it is. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his, serv- his angel and rescued his servants. Now let me just ask you for a second. If I'd said to you an hour before this all took place, if Nebuchadnezzar says to you, I mean, what's the chance that an hour from now Nebuchadnezzar's going to stand up publicly and say, praise be to the God of a group of people who I already defeated in battle, which proves their God is of no value. What's, what's the chance of him standing up and saying, praise be to a God who defies me? What's the chance of that happening? Zero. That's the chance of that happening. Until there were three young men who went with what they thought was right, even though they did not know what was happening, until they said, King, our God is able, and the fact that he is able, we do not know what he will do, but even if he does not rescue us, we will go with him because he's able. We're going to go with him. Now we're close to my favorite part. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own. This is my favorite part. Therefore, I'm making a new rule because my old rule was stupid. New rule, there's a new decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses be burned in piles of rubble and no other god can save in this way. I think Nebuchadnezzar might have had some issues a little bit of anger problem i'm gonna burn them i'm gonna kill them i'm gonna tear down their houses we're gonna burn them we're gonna cut them into pieces after they're dead don't miss the last part for no other god can save in this way no other god is able then the king promoted shadrach meshach and abednego in the province of babylon but they didn't know That's what he was going to do. They didn't know that's what the future held. Just like you don't know what God is going to do. Now I need to be quick to add, it isn't always going to have a happy ending. It isn't always going to turn out perfect. They decided it does not matter. We're going with you because you're able, not because we know what you're going to do. The fact that you're able control the future that is good enough for you for us i'm going to go so would you right now take a connection card it's probably on a seat next to you or or maybe you already took one and you put your name and maybe a number we could text you at or email address we could contact you at and again i get if you're here for the first time it seems a little odd really all we want to do is be able to say thank you for coming for joining in with helping water day become a success and then be able to serve you and help you in any way that we possibly can. We're not going to do anything weird uh, with, with your information, not come into your house. But see, we really believe that everybody has a next step to take with God. And so every week on the back of these cards, we suggest that here's some next steps you could take. Maybe God has led you to something else today, but 
maybe for many of you i mean here's why we've been talking about this for four weeks here's here's what this series is all about i see so many of us who are living our one and only life and and it's not even that long living our one and only life terrorized by fear and i don't want you to live another day another week and another year li- living in fear instead of living the adventure that god intended you to have in this life god wants you to live a life of great faith in him knowing that he is with you knowing that he is able knowing that even though you don't know the future he is able to take care of your future he wants you to believe that he's able and therefore to put your faith in him so maybe you're here this week and there's an area in your life where you you've been debating and you don't know what the future holds and you've been going with your fear maybe your next step today is to say i will live with confidence in the god who is able to take care of my future not continue to give in to believe with what i think will take care of right now maybe if you just check that box see, we pray for every one of these cards and we'd love to be able to pray for you and help you in any way we can for others of you you can't honestly say that you're at that point where you you can say i'm i'm ready to take that step and believe in the god who's able to follow him so maybe maybe the step for you is to say i need to talk to somebody about the fear that's that's ruling my life and why i can't trust god yet you're in a perfectly safe place and we'd love to have the opportunity to talk about that fear all of us have been there at some point or maybe you just need to say hey i'll just come back I'll come back and I'll continue to learn about this God. As we finish this series, as we close, I want to have a chance to pray for you. So would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Now, Father in heaven, we are thankful for your power and your strength that's, that's made evident to us and, and the creation that you've given us and the way that you provided for our lives. And there are many people joining in today that are just terrorized by fear of what's going to happen in their future. And, and they don't know. Their fear is telling them that they know that this way is predictable and they need to go with that. But either way, they don't know what the future holds, but we know that you are able, that you are capable. And the fact that you are able to do something in our future, that's good enough. God, would you help us today to trust you? Would you help people take next steps toward you? Thank you for your son. Thank you for Jesus. In his name I pray, amen.